Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 743. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today's July 26th, 2022. All right, welcome back to another program of Anglican Unscripted. This is where Kevin and George sit down in front of their computers and discuss the news going around the world. Most of it we try to talk about Anglican, as in Anglican Unscripted. Uh, we like to talk about Christian news, and sometimes we get into politics, COVID stuff, and whatever else is going around. So we're glad you could join us. George, how are you doing this week? I am probably 75% home in uh, recovering from my heart surgery. Uh, spiritually, I feel great, and I'm really excited. It was a wonderful Sunday, wonderful weekend. I had people come up to me after the service, and they're telling me about dreams and spiritual experiences. And when I was a young priest, I would sort of get, ooh, this is a little creepy. But you know, you never tr quite know how the Holy Spirit is working. So when somebody comes up to you and said, George, I've been having these dreams, about God for the last three or four nights. And the last things you talked about with this guy were what are the prospects for the Phillies this summer? That's an exciting thing happening. It is, absolutely. So so the spirit is moving. It's just physically, uh, I'm not all the way home. Uh, just still a little tired, a little drawn. Yeah, same here. I'm still recovering from COVID. I finally got a negative test yesterday. So I took mom and dad out for their anniversary last night at the, the local tavern. That's what we have here in Wisconsin, Steakhouse, and that was a lot of fun. But uh, I tell you what, if you watched last week's show, you saw Kevin recording a show with COVID fog. I just wasn't all there. I, you know, extremely congested. I still have a little bit of congestion here, but um, I'm probably... 80% as well, George. We're getting old. It's hard to recover from things like COVID and heart surgeries and uh, showing our age. However, that doesn't stop the news from happening. And right now, can over... I, yep. B before we get into the news, can I get into a reader comment, reader mail? I yeah, well, yeah, absolutely. It's on co this is unscripted. Go for it. Somebody, uh, uh, one of our viewers asked us, how come you never talk about the ethics of COVID? And I had to think about that. What are the ethics of COVID? And, and he said, now we have monkeypox. Why don't you talk about monkeypox? And I'm trying to think, well, what is there? What is the Anglican angle? And he helped me out by saying, monkeypox is being spread among gay men. Therefore, you should condemn promiscuous homosexual sexual activities with strangers. Kevin, do you with me condemn promiscuous sexual behavior? I c condemn both heterosexual and homosexual promiscuous behavior. Absolutely. No, no question and, about it. And it, it, he's right. It, it, I watched a podcast from a, a UK, an official UK uh, doctor, talking about how 97% 97% of the cases are happening with homosexual promiscuous men who have more than four partners a month. <laughs> this is like... Whoa, four partner. I, I've had one partner in 50 years or 30 years. I mean, I, I don't understand that type of promiscuality, but if that's even a word. But you're right, George. So, yes, we, we condemn that type of uh, uh, behavior. But where does Anglicanism fall on COVID? Because we saw the mistakes made by closing all the churches. Where does Anglicanism fall with uh, uh, the spread of diseases? Because we certainly suffered in the in the Black Death and stuff. Yeah, and I believe it or not, I don't think I'm quite qualified <laughs> to talk about the science here. Because at this stage, we are told by the TV sets that uh, the vaccine is basically worthless. Uh, Joe Biden's been vaccinated twice, double boosted, and he catches COVID. And people who are, and the elderly over uh, 80 who are vaccinated are more likely now to catch COVID than those over 80 who are unvaccinated. Mm -hmm. And now we're hearing all these stories about infertility and you know, among young women and young men. Um, I don't know where the truth lies. And here's the sad thing about our society. I no longer 
once upon a time, if the Centers for Disease Control, the CDC, said, this is a big problem and this is why, I would believe it without questioning. But my experience over the last two years uh, is that, you know, truth is, is relative. Just like we had this Dr. Burks, the President Trump's, uh, along with Dr. Fauci, his COVID advisors, her book that just came out saying that she deliberately lied to Donald Trump so in order to get her agenda of mass closings through. Mm -hmm. She knew it wasn't necessary. She knew that uh, uh, people who uh, had COVID were immune. It, she knew all these things that we now hear on TV, but they withheld that information so that they had a public policy victory for what they believed needed to be done. So I can't, sp and here again, I don't know what to believe anymore. I really don't. Well, and that's the biggest failure here is journalism in the last 20 years. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the journalism now is so biased. If you watch the coverage of uh, the Dobbs uh, ruling mm -hmm. from the Supreme Court, you know, 99.99% .99 of all journalism covering Dobbs was pro-abortion. Mm -hmm. And talked about the absolute treachery this will have on women and women will be dying in the streets with uh, coat hangers uh, coming out of their private parts and that's that's been the the main theme now from journalism journalism covered uh, isn't covering Hunter Biden at all there's more uh, evidence of Hunter Biden's uh, work with China than ever before in Pakistan and Ukraine and other places, but it's just not being covered. The FBI has has a team that just deliberately covers it up, and uh, as long as they can keep the their agenda going, the press will cover this up. It's strange to watch because th this is not the, the, the press that we found in, in, over Watergate, which had to find the truth. And this is not just the United States we're talking about. My friends, uh, and I have many in England, tell me the state of English society is just as unsettled as American, where people are just thoroughly sick of being lied to by the, uh, by the elites, by the establishment of being taken advantage of. Um, it's, it's a, and we haven't had riots in the streets yet, except for last summer with Black Lives Matter. Yeah. But, you know, we're seeing places like Malawi and Pakistan and Sri Lanka, even China, people are taking to the streets over feuds, few food shortages, unemployment. We're really at a place in the world uh, that I don't, I, well, it's unpre unprecedented in my lifetime. And I've been, and this is my sixth decade, uh, mm -hmm. So, well, it, things are bad, and the and here's the thing: the church, the institution of the church, the uh, as represented by the bishops and the establishment, has as low a level of trust as just the media. Now, maybe a little higher, but you know, we get people writing in our comment section about Justin Welby saying the average person in the pew just is thoroughly sick of the bishops and Welby and his antics. Um, just as we get them in, the, in my church. Well, to be perfectly honest, my, my parishioners couldn't care less what the bishop or the presiding bishop or what the Episcopal Church says. Because long ago, that the, the church as an institution lost its ability to persuade and influence opinion. Well, I'll give you an example. I live, not live, I'm currently living right outside of Madison, Wisconsin. Madison, Wisconsin, for all intents and purposes, is an extremely liberal city. Uh, it's a university town. University of Wisconsin is here. And before the election, when Trump and Biden were running against each other, the town was littered with Biden signs. Now you can't find a Biden sign uh, to save your life. But... There are strong churches here uh, in the Madison area, good evangelical churches, um, good charismatic churches that are, are scattered around um, the city, and they're full on Sunday. And we're talking about churches that have two, three, four thousand people. When those people leave church on Sunday afternoon after the services are over, they just disappear. They keep their heads down in Madison. They're not out there challenging 
uh, the liberal doctrine that's going around in the newspapers and on the street corners and um, they, they're just afraid to, to put their heads up because they know the church international is not there to protect them they know the church global is not there to protect them and they're just a you know they'll go they'll listen to their praise songs they'll get a good teaching then they'll teach to the children but as far as participating here in the culture they just keep their heads down you know and that's that's a that's a whole new thing it's it's a very weird world uh, i took an uber the other day uh and the driver was uh, was a Nigerian immigrant, and he wanted to talk. And what did he want to talk about? The cost of housing in Florida has just gone through the roof. It's just shooting up. There's not enough cheap housing. Mm -hmm. And this guy who's been in this country for maybe three, four years is saying, we, we really have to do something about immigration. We have too many of these illegal aliens coming across the border and the government gives them all the cheap housing. They don't pay taxes. I pay taxes, and all that money is going out to pay for people who don't pay tax into the system. Mm. And I just thought it was so, uh, what is the word I want to use? A recent Nigerian immigrant who is working maybe 70 hours a week, driving, you know, with a full-time job. He's got a little business, plus he drives an Uber at night. Mm. He's complaining about freeloading illegal immigrants. Um, it's just a funny world in which and, we are. It is strange. I, I brought a property la last year. Oh, and he loves Donald Trump. <laughs> it, it's, you know, it's just, it, he, he's telling me he can't stand the Democrats. He loves Trump. He wants him back with all his heart. I said, well, you're not a citizen. I said, oh, no, but if I could vote, I would if vote. I, if I, I could vote for vote. Donald Trump. Sure. Well, that's the Nigerian. We, we talk about our Nigerian friends all the time. They're frontiersmen. They're business people. They're, mm -hmm. they're a little different ethos than what's coming across from Latin America in the immigration. George, we should let people know that Lambeth is going on. I know you're, you're tuning in to Anglican Scripted. They haven't talked about Lambeth. There, there are 12 minutes in the show. What is going on with Lambeth? Well, Lambeth hasn't started yet, but the fury on Twitter and the fury on Facebook tells me that Lambeth's already over. So let's talk about Lambeth calls, George. Well, right now, Nigerian Uber drivers are taking the bishops from Heathrow and Gatwick, sure. even Stansted airports down to Canterbury. Yeah. Officially, they start the 28th, uh, which what that's that's Thursday. Two days, yep. yep. Uh, they kick off, and right now we're in the gatherings. Well, Kevin, uh, do you have your bleep button ready? <laughs> bleep. Uh, <laughs> what for the shit show? <laughs> Yes, <laughs> over this shit storm uh, that has broken out. Let me explain what's going on. Uh, we've reported uh, a few months ago that Lambeth 2022 is not going to have resolutions as past Lambeths have. They're going to have calls, and there are going to be 10 discussion areas, and there are going to be documents that will guide the calls, and then the bishops will discuss these and make a call to the communion on a certain issue. At the, Lamb at the press conference I attended via Zoom with the Archbishop of Canterbury about a month ago, Justin Welby outlined what the calls would cover, everything from the environment to the debates over human sexuality. So I knew what was coming. And we had sort of the 10 lists, 10, 10 titles, uh, human dignity, the environment, science and faith, you know, those sorts of things. Mm -hmm. Well, okay, we are approaching Lambeth, and the Global South Fellowship of Anglins, Anglicans, which is sort of the parallel organization to GAFCON, the Global South people who aren't in GAFCON are in the Global South, but some of the GAFCON people are in the Global South. So, for instance, Foley Beach is chairman of uh, GAFCON, and he has an office. He, with he, he has some type of role in, in the Global South. I forget Global what it is. South. Yeah. But the Global South are going to Lambeth, and GAFCON isn't. Uh, so that's, if you will, the distinction right now. And the Global South's president is the Archbishop of South Sudan, Justin Badiarama. And Archbishop Badiarama put out uh, a video along with a statement what their hopes were for the Lambeth Conference. And they hoped 
to reaffirm, the conference would reaffirm Lambeth's statement on human sexuality from 1998 Resolution 1.10. Last week, Munir Anis, who was one of the founders of the Global South Fellowship and is still a man working behind the scenes with the bishops, put out a statement saying we really need to do this, we'll reaffirm Lambeth 110. So this is all in the background, if you will. They're going to discuss human sexuality and the conservative leaders attending Lambeth want to reaffirm 110. Friday, I think it was the 22nd, the conference call papers are released. It's a uh, 50 odd page booklet where each call is like three or four pages. Mm -hmm. And some of the stuff's a little silly. Uh, a lot of it is what I would call this Blairite, multi culty, you know, uh, anti colonialism <laughs> stuff. Yes. Woke stuff that <laughs> you, it, it, at this stage, it this is water off the back of the duck. You know, like you just, it's fog and you tune it out. Some stuff, the wokeness goes a bit too far. There's a paper on reconciliation, Lambeth Call on Reconciliation, which is trying to get everybody to, uh, like Rodney King once said, why can't we all get along? Can't we all get um, along? Yeah. That's nice. And, but it's a little, well, I'll read you the declaration, paragraph two. We believe in a God who is both three and one, I, that's Trinity, who okay. holds difference and unity in the heart of God's being as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Difference what? and unity what? in our description of the Trinity. No, no. Uh, <laughs> I, I, Kevin, I don't want to spend six hours discussing the Trinity, the relationship of the persons, the three persons of the Trinity, but difference in unity is a woke heresy. phrase. Yeah, no, well, that's heresy. And, and they're holding this out as a way to describe God's na the nature of the Godhead. Okay, that won't, that won't be in the final call because some smarter, some smart guy in the, or girl in the bishops are going to say, wait, 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 we can't say that. Okay, so we got some silly stuff. But then in the Human Dignity Calls, which was the leader of that group was Howard Gregory of the West Indies, the Archbishop of the West Indies. And he is a liberal on the issues of human sexuality. If you read Anglican Inc., he has made many calls for decriminalization of homosexuality, allowing same-sex marriage in Jamaica. The Anglican Church won't do it, but you should allow civil gay marriage in Jamaica. So Howard Gregory is on the left. Mm -hmm. Um, not hard left, not Episcopal left. In the Episcopal Church, he'd probably be considered a slack-jawed Neanderthal conservative. But within the Anglican world, he's a man of the left, uh, an affirming Catholic, as they right. say. Sure, okay, I got that. All right. Well, well, the document that he came out uh, says we should reaffirm or decide to discuss over the next 10 years the communion's the position on human sexuality and homosexuality, which is the 1998 resolution, Lambeth 110. And Lambeth 110 states that the bishops cannot affirm the moral goodness of homosexuality. And there's other stuff in there. Now, it does say we need to recognize the value of the homosexual people. We know what sure, you mean absolutely. to them. Yes. yes. Yeah. It also says that, uh, it also says that uh, we would pray for people and for those who are trapped in the homosexual lifestyle. So in essence, they're, you know, what the Church of England went through this all the folder all, you can't pray for gay people and try to convert them. Lambeth it's 110. 11, 10. Yeah. yeah. Now, some people say, well, it doesn't say it exactly as you just said it, George. No, but it says it in the language of those who wrote it. That's what they meant. And I was there. I know it because I typed it for them. <laughs> okay. Uh, so this, this is released reaffirm or kick the can down the road for 10 years okay, you have two options they give you know the, the bishops have two options you can reaffirm this as a teaching of Lambeth one uh, of Lambeth a resolution of Lambeth or we can just say hey we don't completely agree with it but we're gonna keep it's still part of the process of being Lambeth there's now a third option George 
Well, to get to that third option, we had a hissy fit. Um, the liberals in the Church of England, in the American Church, the Scotch, in the Welsh Church, and the Canadian Churches all had a hissy fit. And John Harvey Taylor, the Bishop of Los Angeles, put out a blog post saying, no matter what Lambeth says, we're still going to bless and support and honor gay marriage because that's of God. And, you know, it's terrible that we can't reject Lambeth 110. And, and the Bishop of Niagara, Canada, the Bishop of Edmonton, Canada, uh, the Welsh bishops, the Scottish bishops, all came in saying, no, 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 we're already all into gay marriage. And if our only two choices are uh, affirming what we don't believe or kicking the can down the road for 10 more years that leaves in place the official Anglican teaching which is not a legal teaching but is a moral teaching a statement of the mind of the communion Lambeth 110 was adopted by a 500 plus votes to 70 votes it was overwhelmingly adopted as the mind of the Anglican world where what human sexuality the goods are good of human sexuality. So they're all having a hissy fit. And the gay activists are now, in England, they exploded. Uh, Colin Coward and nine other gay leaders in the Church of England, not all of them are gay, but you know, involved in the same-sex ministries and, mar and marriage issues, put out a statement on Modern Church saying that uh, this just sabotages the Church of England's own internal deliberations, the living and love and fellowship conversations. If, the, if Lambeth is saying that we reaffirm or just kick it down the road for 10 more years, at the very best, the Church of England can't make a decision on this for 10 more years. And some English bishops, like the Bishop of Leicester, the Bishop of Ely, said, well, it doesn't matter. We don't pay any attention to what Lambeth says anyway. So all of this stuff is blowing up because the advocates for gay marriage in the Church of England through the LLF process are furious because all of their machinations to bring about gay marriage have will now collapse if Lambeth does this. They're claiming a bait and switch. Nobody told us we'd talk about this. We thought we'd just talk about mosquito nets and and all and you know the normal sort of folder all. And in fact, one of the people on this group, a bishop, suffragan bishop from Toronto, he's the bishop of York Scarborough area in Toronto, Diocese of Toronto, Kevin Robertson, said, I was on this committee and we never talked about this. Well, that may be true for the meetings you went to, but Justin Welby was talking about this at a press conference a month ago. Um, so. May, there was never anything that I heard in the press conference of reaffirming Lambeth 110, but if the bishops are going to talk about human sexuality, I think it's obvious that they would start from where we are right now. Lambeth 110 should come up, absolutely. And I think watching kind of what the response on Twitter is people saying Justin has misled us, Justin has lied, uh, the, the Lambeth Calls Committee has lied to us, um, how did this get by us? And I think one of the things people assumed once the conservatives weren't going to Lambeth, is that everything would be a cakewalk. As long as Nigeria is not there, Uganda is not there, Kenya's not there, this is going to be our Lambeth. We're going to control the conversation, and uh, anything that comes up, we can handle. And you can tell two days before Lambeth starts, they can't handle it. And, okay, so we have the shitstorm over the weekend. Uh, forgive my language. <laughs> no bleep today. Um, and then uh, an announcement comes out that the Lambeth Conference uh, organizers hear this complaint and they'll meet uh, Monday night to decide what to do. And on Monday evening UK time, a press release was put out, authored by Tim Thornton, who is, the bish who is one of the bishop's assistants at Lambeth, former bishop of Exeter or Truro, somewhere in the southwest of England. Bishop Thornton says, we're going to add a third option. Bishops can reject Lambeth 110, and we're going to edit the Lambeth call on human dignity. So the, what the edited item looks like, we don't know. 
but it makes logical sense that Lambeth 110 will still be discussed if an option is there to reject it. Um, now we contacted uh, the Global Fellowship, Global South Fellowship of Anglicans. Paul Eddy is their press man. He's a Church of England vicar who's very active in the uh, the international movements. And I said, now, what do you guys have to say about this? Because what the liberals want is the opposite of what Munir Nice and the Global South Anglicans want. And uh, Paul Eddy had a comment of uh, essentially that uh, we're having our press conference on Friday and we will go into this in great detail. And what he didn't say out loud, which is what I, is that all our guys are still in the air. That's right. And they're flying there. They're flying. They're flying there. Um, and they're not like Americans with their Apple uh, MacBook Pros on the airplane wired into uh, the internet as they're flying. Uh, they're going, coming from uh, uh, the Congo. They're coming from Sudan. They're coming from all these places that don't have the ease of a communication. So we'll get the Global South Fellowship of Anglicans response on Friday. But I'm inclined to believe that they will not back down from their call that we reaffirm Lambeth 110. Now, having said all this, that's sort of the background. I think, as the Bishop of Brecon said in a blog post, how the hell did this happen? <laughs> and what is going on? Well, and yes, it, what, but if... It, in my observation here, in just mere moments, Lambeth has come from uh, we're going to discuss some mighty topics to be no better than the Jesus Seminar. You know, we're going to uh, put some questions before you. You're going to decide what's godly and not godly. You know what? And th th it's ridiculous, George. Well, that's what they did in '98 under George Carey. They tried to set the boundaries of Anglican life and witness and what is godly and ungodly. Mm -hmm. And that's produced the vote of 500 plus to 70 plus. It, by any measure, that's a super majority view. Well, the liberals don't give up. And Rowan Williams was one of those in the 70. He was one of those who voted against. And he wrote, and he was one of the co-authors of a minority statement after Lambeth 110. So 2008 rolls around, and to prevent this from ever happening again, they did the Indaba nonsense, where we're going to drown the bishops in small groups with facilitators and pre-planned, and you know, just to make sure nothing happens and no resolutions, and it's basically a total fudge. And it worked. Mm -hmm. and, but it maybe didn't work enough because I rem remember Kevin on that last day, Justin Welby told us at the press conference I that think it was Rowan Williams. Ro Rowan Williams. Sorry, you're right. That's right. Rowan Williams on that last day of the press conference, he told us that a statement would be he would have a statement shortly on human sexuality. What the communion believed. <laughs> yeah. We're still waiting, Rowan. Still waiting. Uh, <laughs> we will still accept your statement. Okay. So Justin Welby comes along, and Justin Welby is an institutionalist. Preservation of the institution of the Church of England and its prerogatives are, in my view, his primary motivation. He's not a theologian like Justin Welby. He's not a uh, parish vicar writ, writ large like George Carey. He's a bureaucrat, and preservation of the institution is all that matters. So he's got a problem. Gafcon's out the door. The three largest provinces are not playing up games. He's got the rest of the global south, which is about 70% of those attending in terms of membership and whatnot. And they're saying, we got to reaffirm Lambeth 110. We got to reaffirm Lambeth 110. You can give us all the, the Blairite nonsense, uh, you know, peace, love, and happiness, minority rights, diversity, unity, all that crap. We don't care. It doesn't matter for us. So long as we can go home and say, well, this is what we as Anglicans believe. And I think Welby was perfectly happy to allow the left in the Church of England to take one to preserve the institution. 
the left wasn't willing to do that and they've hit back really hard and you finally now have bishops breaking the collegiality of the Church of England before this time you only had one fellow the Bishop of Buckingham mm -hmm. saying things that were contrary to the team now we've got the Bishop of Southwark the Bishop of Ely the Bishop of Leicester uh, and a few others now breaking ranks and saying no 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 so now Justin is trying to fudge this once again and I actually think this is a good thing because they are going to talk about the elephant in the room before all this happened everybody be divided up and okay I'm in the group talking about science and faith if we're talking about Lambeth Lambeth 110 uh, so I'm going to skip the science and faith class and I'm going to go to the let 110 vote and discuss that so the it's a shitstorm for Justin Welby because he's mishandled it and well I think he I, I don't know if he mishandled it or he didn't understand the firestorm that was going to come I mean the Church of England is fine with the gospel of John Lennon and uh -huh. Most of the Anglican community doesn't understand that that's what they're preaching, the, the John Lennon gospel. And the rest of the community is happy as long as they have that Lambeth, Lambeth 110 to say, here, here's the paper that says we're on the up and up, we have the full understanding of human sexuality, and we're not teaching heresy on sexual ethics. This is our 110. And no, the liberals say we're John Lennon all in. And you're not allowed to have your 110. And if we can overturn, take it away, and apologize for that colonialism in 110, we will do so. A few years ago, Colin Coward was actually a friend of Kevin and yeah, mine. Yeah, yeah, we like him. He is a very, very strong minded gay activist. Mm -hmm. And he could be pretty strong in his opinions on Facebook and tweets and whatnot. He met with David Porter, who was the Archbishop of Canterbury's chief of staff. And Colin Coward reported after that meeting that Justin Welby was willing to lose the 15% on the hard left and the hard right in the Church of England. He's willing to lose the activists on either side to preserve the middle. This is what I think was happening at Lambeth 2022. Justin Welby was willing to lose and take hits so long as to preserve the core problem for Justin is that the core is conservative the global south the core is not England the core is not America it's not Canada and I think it was a miscalculation that he could play these games um, see what motivates the goal see what uh, this is cruel but what <laughs> motivates Justin Welby is the ap approbation of the BBC and the Guardian sure and society so that the church is seen to be doing something. It seems to be relevant and with it and all this and that. The church of what's happening now. Well, if culture loves us, we're doing a good job. For the global South Anglicans, and there are some skunks there. We've got a later, we've got a story about <laughs> one of them later. Uh, for them, the vast majority, it's what would, what does our faith teach us? What does the Bible say? Mm -hmm. Not what the Guardian says, but what is the unchanging truth of the Bible? We who are in the front lines against militant Islam, for instance, uh, what does the scripture tell us on these points? And I, I, th I think he's misinterpreted the mood that being able to flannel, being able to massage uh, individual archbishops to go along to get along, doesn't translate well to a larger group. Well, I, I also don't think he understood the how loud that minority can be. The minority position on L Lambeth 110 is all over Twitter. The liberals mm -hmm. in the Church of England, the liberals in uh, the Episcopal Church in, in Canada own Twitter. And mm -hmm. they're out there screaming from, you know, high heaven, how dare Lambeth even challenge us on 110. Let, you know, the 110 is old colonialism. Uh, it's not the future of the church. The future of the church is, you know, uh, LGBTQ2 whatever rights. You know, it, it's the acronym of the age. It's zeitgeist. 
and um, that that loud call that he sees on Twitter and the Lambeth organizers see on Twitter is not the voice of the communion. It's the minority of the communion. On, on Sunday, I wrote to the Lambeth press officer, Janet Miles, um, and I asked her two questions after this initially broke, and they were technical questions. Uh, what I asked was, how, what rules of order or parliamentary procedure will Lambeth use, the conference use? Yeah. In other words, there are, before yeah, this uh, before this change on Monday, there were people saying, we're going to propose changing the rules and changing this and adding that. How would they do that? In other words, is there a guidebook or a rules of order or, you know, things like that that would guide it? And I didn't get an answer. And the second question I asked was, I noticed that a retire a former Suffolk Bishop of Toronto, who is now a parish rector, writes on Facebook that she has been invited to attend and participate in Lambeth. And my question was, how many other former bishops or bishops who do not exercise Episcopal office are coming to Lambeth? And that also was not answered. Now, we can expect Josiah Wadaw Ferron, sure. who's the ACC. Understandable, head. yep. We can expect Paul Kwong, the former Archbishop of Hong Kong, because he's still ACC uh, chairman. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure there's some other retired bishops who exercise on some Anglican committee or the Anglican Center in Rome. People are still active, but not holding Episcopal office. But this is a case of a woman who was a suffering bishop in Toronto who is now rector of a parish in the Diocese of Toronto, and she's asked to come along. Has, uh, has this been extended to other people at, who are, if, if you will, not white or people like us? And of course, that has not been answered as well. Right. So, so what we're seeing is we're, if you, to be cynical, uh, the Africans, uh, the Global South can say, why are you diluting uh, the bishops here by inviting your buddies? The left can say, you lied to us. You, We were told, uh, we, we put up with not having the gay spouses come. We told you we thought this was a bad idea. And now you're going to force Lambeth 110 down our throats a second time. And we're not going to stand for it. So Friday's press conference from the Global South Anglicans, I think will be really interesting. Uh, I've pro now, it's not going to be online or live, but they said they will release via Facebook a video recording so we can see what is going to happen now. Um, as a bit of critique and commentary, if Justin Welby can have live Zoom press conferences, you guys should be able to also. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Come on not that hard get your little iphones out there and, and uh live zoom it on facebook um it'll work well so that's our, our our first report and lambeth hasn't even started yet that's just our our initial lambeth is coming and uh to to make this short the liberals exploded on on uh twitter and facebook because they got the lambeth calls lambeth call says uh Lambeth 110 is still in play. What do you think about it? Now they they, they exploded. They have a, a third option. The third option is you don't like Lambeth 110. That's your third option. So they're just trying to break that down for you guys. If you didn't catch the last 40 minutes of what we're talking about, let's move on to some other news, George. We'll cover Lambeth again next show. Uh, General Convention Communion Partners have provided, or the Communion Partners have provided an update on General Convention, and it's all about the prayer book. Yeah, if these guys wanted to step on their own news, they couldn't have done a better job by releasing it on July 25th, the same day as the Lambeth Calls controversy comes out. But hey, the communion partner bishops are they are what they are they are what they um, are they put out a statement which we'll publish on anglican inc and you can read it at your leisure uh expressing their views about the recent episcopal general convention and they are more focused on prayer book revision now i'm encapsulating what they're saying you can read their exact words um they're saying that uh the, i'm interpreting what they're saying as saying as meaning the line in the sand for us is revision of the prayer book. 
if we have added into the prayer book gay marriage rights, transgender rebaptisms, or whatever latest nonsense comes up, uh, that's a lot. That's a step too far for us. No, general convention. But that's always been the case. They've always said the prayer book is that line in the sand because we we would come to the questions about well, look what's happening at general convention. Doesn't matter. They're not going to change the prayer book. It takes forever to change the prayer book. It takes forever to change the prayer book, Kevin. And until they change the prayer book, none of this matters. Not so, George. Well, the uh, communion partners uh, at the general convention they debated having a uh, virtual prayer book, a prayer book in the cloud. In other words, we wouldn't reprint the prayer book, uh, but we would just add stuff that you could access via the cloud. So George's little church in Hooterville would not be distressed by having somebody idly leafing through a new prayer book and seeing a gay marriage right, because they'd still have the 79 books in the pew in front of them. But if they happen to go onto the internet and look up, they could find it. So a slight leisure domain there to keep us uh, hicks happy. Um, the uh, communion partners are saying that we need to have an accommodation that preserves the rights and views of traditional Episcopalians on marriage and human sexuality. And we need to find a workaround to uh, imposing a new prayer book because that's the line that they don't say what they're going to do. There are no threats. There are no this. There knows that. Um, they had a comment uh, about the abortion debates, where it was brought, where these votes on abortion were brought up without comment or debate, and they're just saying, you know, look, we can't do that um, because a vast number of Episcopalians are pro-life. They're not all pro-choice like the uh, leadership is. So. It was. I won't, don't, won't call it a tepid statement, but it was a brave statement given the threats these fellows live under in the Episcopal Church. Mm -hmm. Mindful of the example made of Bill Love of guys stepping out of line. Yeah. Uh, we have a real Indian corruption story. Let's talk about that real quick. Uh, in fact, the bishop is on his way to Lambeth 2022. <laughs> Last week, we reported on, I'm going to look up his name, Dharmaraj Rasalam. He's the bishop of South, bishop in South Kerala. Mm -hmm. uh, and he's also the moderator of the Church of South India. A call was made. He's under criminal indictment, criminal investigation for fraud, selling places at a diocesan-owned medical college, medical school. And if and if you live in Florida, half your doctors will be graduates of Indian medical schools who then immigrate to the U.S. It's a ticket to yeah. fortune and fame in India. Um, we, there was a move to deny him a passport because there was a f fear, we reported last week, that he would not return to the country because of the crimes he's accused of. Well, yesterday, um, Monday, the police raided his home, the diocesan offices, and the homes of the diocesan secretary and uh, financial advisor. The secretary and the financial advisor could not be found and are rumored to be out of the country right now. But the bishop had the police go through his things for 13 hours, and his lawyers were able to get him, uh, I, I guess you call it bond of some sort, mm -hmm. so that he could travel outside the country for the Lambeth Conference. This is a member of the Global South Coalition. This is the primate of Church of South India. Uh, not all these fellows who think theologically on human Christian ethics and sexuality think the right things are squeaky clean all around. Nope, they're not. All right, last news story for today, and um, it's basically how long should a person serve in office in the church? Uh, most uh, provinces have you time out at uh, 65, 68, 70. Uh, if you're in the Roman Catholic Church and you're a pope, you, you're supposed to time out when you die. When you're the Archbishop of Canterbury, when should you time out and retire? And, you know, if you're Rowan, you, you hop out early. If you're the Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby, you hold on to your 70, George. 
Justin Welby had an interview with the Times, I think it was published Saturday or Sunday, and he said he's going to stick around until he's turned 70. He's 66. He, and he had the line, I'll stay so long as people want me to stay. Uh, um, mm. I think there's a good number of people who mm. want you to go, like I, the uh, John, <laughs> Smy- uh, uh, John Smythe victims yep, and uh, so on and so forth. Uh-huh. And, uh, <clears throat> but no, well, it's, so the, you know, putting the false modesty aside, he's in it for the long haul. He has a mission. He has a mission from God. As uh, Dan Aykroyd told us in uh, the Blues Brothers. Now, what that mission actually entails, other than preserving the institution, he didn't go into any great detail. But he's sticking it out for four years. Four more years. Four more years. Oh, boy. Well, I mean, for you and I, it's job security. You know, it's like the days of Catherine Jefford Shorey. You know, and just the gold in the field. All right, George. That is can, what. Yeah, can yeah. I respond to one of our one of our viewers' questions? Um, sure, go ahead. Absolutely. Um, somebody wrote on the on uh, the YouTube question. Well, what does a conservative victory look like? Does it mean you know he's from the diocese of Southern? The bishop there is all into the gay uh, movement, as is the dean of the cathedral. Um, the diocese is just out there. What would a conservative uh, victory look like in the Church of England? Well, I don't know because England is England; it has its own way of doing things. But what did a liberal victory look like in the Episcopal Church? The expulsion of seven hundred priests mm-hmm. and maybe a dozen bishops, litigation for years, and conservatives either retreating into fortresses or being like George. I am more like. One of these Japanese soldiers on a, a Philippine island, 25 years after the war, still fighting the war for the emperor. Sure. And the U.S. Marines can't be bothered to land and clear out, clear me out of the jungle. Uh, 8:15, and the liberal establishment can't be bothered to clear me out of Hooterville because you know there's no highway here, so you have to take the back <laughs> roads. And so maybe I'm just uh, not on the radar. Well, I, I think, well, if you think of being on the radar, people like George aren't on the radar until you want to seek a higher office. Well, yes. That, okay. I mean, that, a higher you, office is closed for me. But yeah, uh, so if you want to put a purple shirt on or you feel a call to that, I think that's when the uh, uh, Second Avenue says, uh, no, 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 uh, or try to, to thwart that type of thing. No, but you're right. Uh, there there are people like yourselves who have successful Episcopal churches um, who yeah. operate completely under the radar, who have the nodding approval of your bishop, but maybe not the uh, uh, participation of your bishop and you, you get to do what you need to do. And it works. And so what a liberal victory in the Episcopal church looked like was marginalization of those who hold unpopular views I don't want to call the majority views or minority views because there is no link between the views of the uh, leadership and the views of the people in the pews. We're not a democracy by any means. No. We're an oligarchy, a liberal oligarchy. Um, but it means expulsion of troublesome clergy. It means it's the start of what we saw with Calvin Robinson. Here's a troublesome black man who is not mouthing the right political pieties in the eyes of the Church of England, in the eyes of the Church, in the eyes of the Bishop of London and the Bishop of uh, Edmonton in the Diocese mm-hmm. of London, and that's what it looks like. Where we strangle the baby in the crib, or we force these people out. Oh, I've got an unverified story of uh, meaning. I can't prove it, so I can't write about it. Of a uh, a uh, vicar in the Diocese of I think it's Der- Derby. Der- well. Uh, somewhere in the middle muddle of England, who has been uh, forced out of his office because on on uh, forced out of his parish because he supports the traditional views on marriage. He's been given a uh, non-disclosure agreement to sign, and out the door he goes with uh, you know a small package, and you're gone, fella. Now, so what is happening is we're seeing the liberal victory that has happened in England working itself out through these smaller scale under the radar except for calvin robinson expulsions 
in the Episcopal Church, we had Catherine Jeffrey Shorey, you know, we had a uh, Russian Revolution type, let's uh, shoot all the hostages. And so what would a conservative victory look like? Well, if we really are at a place where we believe one side is acting and teaching something that is contrary to God, you, you fill in the dots, what follows? Because that's well, what the liberals think about me. Sure. Now, but I want to take this to the higher level here. What would God consider a victory? Uh, the, the victory here would be uh, repentance. The victory here would be those who are walking away from God to turn back. It would be for the lost sheep to be found. It would be for the lepers to be healed. I mean, victory, uh, as far as God is concerned, is much different than what we you know, see as uh, orthodox and liberals. You know, as conservatives and liberals, I think God sees, you know, a, a return of the whole church in unity through repentance. And that's victory. That applies as much to the conservatives in the United States still remaining in the Episcopal sure. Church as sure. it does yeah. to uh, the conservatives in England of repenting of our pride, mm -hmm. our uh, arrogance mm -hmm. um, in thinking that we know intimately what God's plan is. We can only just go back to Scripture again and again and again mm -hmm. and test what we're doing against what the plain Word of God teaches us. Yeah, or repent for not holding uh, certain bishops accountable decades ago. Well, you know, that lots of stuff. So, you know, the, the repentance belongs on both sides, uh, absolutely. But what does victory look like? It looks like what it's going to be when we uh, are all, all before the throne. That's victory. All right. Well, victory, that, co victory comes when the Lord returns in glory. Absolutely. So there, gave you some higher theology there. I'm Kevin Carlson. And I'm George Conger, and you've been watching episode 743 of Anglican Unscripted. <laughs>